Hi, I'm Jack Lesenberry, and welcome to my podcast. I've been writing and doing journalism since the last days of hot metal type. I've pretty much done everything, from being a roving foreign correspondent to a television host, a radio news analyst, and a city magazine editor. I've interviewed Gerald Ford about Watergate, Jack of Orkin about suicide, and Kwame Kilpatrick about that famous party of his. Most of all, what I like doing is telling stories, sharing interesting things I've learned, and especially getting people to tell stories that reveal sides of themselves that most people really don't know. I also think I have a pretty good grasp of how Michigan and the nation work, and who the people who run it are. For those of you who are fans of my daily essays during the many years I was with Michigan Radio, we'll have those too. So make sure to listen as often as you possibly can, and remember, there's no charge for listening twice. And also, please follow my writing on my blog, Lessonberry Inc., that's I-N-K like inkpen.com. One of the most fascinating and significant stories I ever covered was the battle Dr. Jack Kevorkian waged to give people the right to end their lives and suffering when they became unbearable. Very early on, I realized that Kevorkian's lawyer, Jeffrey Figer, was not only legally brilliant, but a fascinating multidimensional person in his own right. I did stories for the New York Times and later Vanity Fair and Esquire about the lawyer who kept Dr. Death free. Kevorkian's now long gone, but if you live in Michigan, you'll undoubtedly still see Jeffrey Figer's commercials. But there's a lot more to the man than the pit bull lawyer. He joins us today. Jeffrey, welcome to my podcast, and thanks for making time for us today. Well, thanks, Jack. It's an honor for you to have me on. Uh, is this your inaugural week or, or bi-weekly or whatever? I don't know how long you've been doing this. Well, I'm trying not to do it weekly. I want to be as strong as possible, but uh, uh, we're, we're, we're hoping for as often as possible. And I wonder... That's good. You, I, I wonder, really, Jeffrey, what makes you tick? I mean, you don't do this just for the money. What really is the thrill? What really defines you? I don't know what defines me, but I can tell you that I what I tell uh, uh, young law students when I speak to them is that uh, what I do for a living doesn't seem like work for me. And if they can do something for a living that doesn't seem like work, they've got it made. Um I really just like what I do. It doesn't seem like work. And uh, so every day when I go into the office, I feel like I'm going to my home. And uh, handling cases is fun. And I, I never lose the it, it never lose the funness of it. I know that's not a word. but uh, And so I guess I'm, I'm just like I always was, even when I was. Doesn't everybody want to have fun? You think so, and I think there's nothing more important in life than loving what you do. Yeah, yeah, and just having fun. Kids want to have fun. It's so um, I'm an adult that still wants to have fun. Most adults do. Most adults, I think, hate what they do. They really um, find it uh, excruciating. They they look at work as an unnecessary uh, interference or an unfortunate interference in their lifestyle, and they can't wait to get out. And that's why they quote unquote retire. I guess I'm reaching the age now. People keep saying to me, "Well, are you going to retire?" And I, it sounds so strange to me because I couldn't imagine retire to what to right. do what. I can't even imagine it. And I mean, I'm at the age where nobody ever mentioned that to me before. Maybe it's because my hair is kind of whitish, but uh, um, <clears throat> I'm not retiring because that would mean I'm I'm. I'm retire for me would be retiring from life. Somehow I don't see you on the couch while watching the game of the week uh, endlessly. I can't do it. I can't do it. Uh, first of all, I can't listen to the cliches of the, the year after year after year. I have heard every cliche that can ever be used for any broadcast ball game. I don't know how anybody can listen to it anymore. <laughs> I think I'm in favor of no sound anymore, man. They might make there's people who turn the sound down. You know, you've dealt with thousands of defendants, I'm sure, over the years, both in in your malpractice pra uh, practice, in you know, more politically and society oriented cases. Um, what do you think overall about our legal system? Does it work? It's only as good as the uh, uh, the theory of it does. Um, the but it's only as good as the people that you have populating it. And it is as susceptible to the um, untoward forces um, that exist in our society as, as uh, the other branches of government. The legal system is simply the third branch of government. Um, and you 
you've seen what's happened with the executive. You've seen what's happened with the legislature, uh, legislatures and the legislative process. And the legal system is as susceptible. For instance, really what's going on with Trump, and, and perhaps the only reason for his continued uh, existence, in other words, why the, the Senate hasn't turned against him, the Republican Senate, is his uh, uh, agreement to to uh, put in uh, virtually any uh, Federalist judge, arch-conservative right-wing. They're not really conservatives, they're very radical, but arch-right-wing judges. Uh, and his willingness to do that is almost the, the reason that the, the sole reason that he uh, continues uh, to uh, maintain some support in the Republic with the Republican majority in the Senate. What is and the those fact judges will have an impact on the uh, legal system and it won't be good. What is the fact that somebody like that could become president? What does that say about our society and our system? It says terrible not, not the system. It says something terrible, terrible about us. That we were well in the Ukraine, they just elected a comedian. That's by right, seventy-one percent of the vote. I don't know anything about him. Maybe he's a great guy, but I think they did that in Italy too, and he got out of office really, really quickly. But our willingness to have elected a guy who's was an utter, and if, if anyone cared to look, was obviously a, a con man who uh, had uh, had terrible terrible business acumen, who was a self-promoter uh, ex- par excellence, and whose really only success um, was the uh, Apprentice TV show, which permitted him or put him in, in front of uh, millions and millions of people for 14 seasons, and that people somehow believed that he was that character. <laughs> he was a thousand times worse than the character he was playing on The Apprentice. They call it a reality show, but it's not. It's scripted. Do you think? Do you that think that, all, that does not bode well for America? It does not bode well. I, you know, I don't particularly like George Will. I mean, I like him, but I don't agree with a lot of the things he says. I like what he says about Trump now. But he really, I mean, viscerally hates Trump. And they said, well, would you like to get rid of him? He says, no, no, America's got to get punished for a little while. Uh, you know, so they realize they'll never do this to themselves again. And I like that. He said that, and, you know, for, for a, a very strong Republican conservative to be right. saying that is, is pretty extraordinary. Now, you, do, you understand politics. You ran for governor in 1998. Do you think the Democrats can defeat Trump? I don't think there's any question that that a, a competent Democrat can and will defeat Trump. All you've got to look at is how he was elected uh, in this past election, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, by uh, something less than uh, 90,000 votes, 8,000 votes in Michigan. Um, that's not going to happen again. He's going to lose Michigan. I, I can't conceive of him winning Pennsylvania or Wisconsin. So how does he win now? What states is he go, is he likely to win under the electoral college system? That's he didn't, you know, he won by by sheer almost accident. Right. Certainly didn't win the popular vote, and I don't see a circumstance. And, and it was truly a, a royal flush, if you want to liken it to some. It, 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 to happen again, he would have had to build up some type of of of, of, of ability. To, to duplicate that, he, he he doesn't go after any of the, and those were infinitesimally small amounts by which he won by. Right. What's he going to do now? He's going to lose Michigan, as the way it stands. He's going to lose Pennsylvania, the suburbs of Pennsylvania. He's going to lose Wisconsin. They've all gone in uh, in these off season heavily Democrat. What's going to turn them for in favor of Trump? I would like to know his strategy for winning. Well, I think a strategy for winning is based on demonizing the Democrats, and of course, it won't be a straight vote on whether you want Trump or not. It'll be Trump against some Democrat. Do you see? Yeah, and the Republicans always do that. I don't. Americans, when are they going to wake up? They demonize now immigrants and migrants. And remember, there was the war on drugs, and you demonized drugs, and then the terrorists. You declared war on a 
on a noun. Um, and they've always had the boogeyman, the Republicans, because they really were never the majority of the party. Right. They were the party that instigated hate. I can't really, you know, the, the Southern Democrats were guilty too, but that's besides the point. Um, and they instigate hate. And uh, how or why people would vote? You know, in, in today's age, why do the Democrats simply need to remind uh, America, the Republicans have always been against Social Security. They were always against Medicare. That's why they're against your health insurance now. And it's never going to get any better. I don't even understand how an American could look themselves in the face and say, I'd rather have an insurance bureaucrat run my health insurance. Why, why is this country the way it is? I mean, you, you are a philosopher. Well, yeah, I'll tell you why. And when I was born in 1950, there were 150 million Americans. There are now in excess of 350 million Americans. And I don't want to be disingenuous, but I don't. I, I think that a certain amount of inher- intelligence is inherited, and I think the mean uh, intelligence of this country has gone down exponentially by virtue of the population explosion. Uh, you've got an additional 250 million people here, and I don't think there are 250 million real smart people. Why is that? I mean, why are we breeding dumber people if that, in fact, is the case? Well, it be. Dumb people have more kids than smart people. Well, there's that's not a it's not a terrible thing to say. I mean, I just think uh, if, if if you look at the statistics, you know, I don't see a lot of real bright college educated. I don't think, for instance, you don't have to be bright to go to college. There's a lot of stupid people in college. Intrinsically bright people might, for instance, my grandparents. I don't think went to college. I think they were probably bright. And their children exceeded, far exceeded what my grandparents have exceeded. And, and, and my parents were very bright. I've exceeded a little, maybe not as much as my parents. They were probably smarter than me. But I, I just think that uh, um, probably smart people aren't having as many children as, <laughs> as the people who are uh, uh, choosing to vote for Trump. But Trump, Trump's obviously the result of pure, unadulterated, and they don't say it in the press, racism. His ability to maintain a level of 40 to 45 percent of the electorate, no matter what he does, in the face of that bar report, which demonstrates, if somebody reads that, especially the second half of that 400-page report, we have a criminal. We have a criminal in office, and this is just a criminal with regard to the, uh, the interference of Russia and obstruction of justice. Nobody's talking about his real criminal activities, which is his financial criminal activities. Right. He's run a, 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 a house of cards financial scam for years. He went bankrupt four times. He, and, and, and he's a scam artist. And when they start looking into, and that's what he really, really, that's why he's gone crazy in terms of the uh, uh, house going after his finances and getting into his not only his tax returns, but his auditing companies. Um, because, you know, I mean, everybody forgets, by the way, Cohen is going to jail for election fraud. And in the indictment, it says that uh, that uh, Trump was part of the election fraud. Right. And, and everybody forgets about that. <laughs> It, uh, do you think and I was tried for it, by the way. I was charged for a lot less than Trump was engaged in. That's right. You were acquitted by a federal jury. Yeah. And, by the way, obstruction of justice. I was charged with obstruction of justice for telling an FBI agent that my partner should answer his, my dead partner should answer his question. Now, if that can get you charged in a grand jury and they allow that to go to trial— Anybody who says that the facts weren't there for Trump's obstruction of justice is just knows nothing about the law. Oh, and hasn't read the Mueller report. Um, you know, you spe- right. speaking of, of kids, I think that everybody knows you as the world's toughest pit bull lawyer, but you're also one of the most devoted fathers I've seen. You've got three young well, kids. You. Are you worried about your oldest son's about to go to college? Are you worried about the America they're going to grow up in? Yeah. Children, uh, my male children are uh, are 
part African American. I'm worried about them driving home at night and hmm. getting pulled over. Duh. I'm worried about that. Um, well, that's that's something. Do you think any of them will follow you into the law? <laughs> I never wanted to be a lawyer. I don't. You know, I don't think you could tell you if you tell your children to be what you are. I think you're making a sorry mistake. Well, they might, but uh, it'll they'll have to find their own direction through indirection. Well, find ne- direction through indirection out. If you never wanted to be a lawyer, how would you end up becoming probably the most prominent lawyer in Michigan? Girls. Girls? Yeah, what? girls. Is I that- ran out of college. To- I always liked smart women, and I ran out of college degrees. I had a bachelor's and master's degree from Michigan, and then I had to keep going to college because I just I didn't really want to go out and be an actor or something like that. So I continued to go to college because I like girls. That's why. I think I think you told me once that when you started law school, it was kind of kicking and screaming, and then you said it was like trying a food you never knew you liked. Yeah, yeah, or a sport that you're good at, or an instrument that you never knew you had a proclivity for. I'd always, you know, been brought up in a home that spoke the law. My uncle was the dean of a law school. My dad was a lawyer. So it's a foreign language to most people, except for me, it wasn't. It was I was raised, if, if you think about it, in a bilingual home, the bilingual part being the law. And I understood it. I understood it intuitively. I didn't understand that I knew it. And so it was, and then I saw a different way to handle it too, because I understood it in a way different than I didn't have to learn it. I understood it kind of in my bones. Then I started, when I was in law school, I started thinking about different ways to approach an an issue that would be more fun or would be more creative or, or, or more attractive to me. And, uh, um, so that's, was the development. You know, the one place you've always been supremely popular in Detroit, when you ran for governor, Detroit has voted for you overwhelmingly. What do you think about Detroit? Is Detroit really going to make a comeback? Is Duggan have the city on the right track? On the right track? No, not Duggan, Gilbert. We need 50 more Dan Gilberts. You cannot exist without 50 more of him. And we're, we've done wonderfully. Nobody should criticize him for anything he's done, although, you know, he's bought up the city of Detroit, and he's going to develop only a very, very small uh, um, small part of it, and he's going to try to flip the rest. But I don't see anybody else coming in to do what he's doing, and I'm hoping that they do. Um, because, you know, if, you know, I was a little concerned several weeks ago. There was quite a number of stories about the fact that uh, Wall Street was rating that Quicken Loans as junk bonds because they don't get, they don't understand the nature of his business. I know he was quite upset about that, but quite frankly, I don't either. I don't see that as a as an enduring business model. And and for the entire city of Detroit to be dependent upon the, the relative success of Quicken Loans is, to me, would be rather scary. Uh, and I'm not being critical of him. I think he's right. done an amazing, an amazing job. And even if he was rock solid, you know, they used to say, as goes the as goes GM, so goes uh, the country. And you see what happened to GM. So that means, I think, relatively, that means nothing. But we can't exist on one thing. We can't. We've been a one-horse town with three auto companies, and look where that got us. We certainly can't be a one-horse town with one quick and loan. It's got to be more. Well, how does Detroit get beyond having one? You, first of all, we thought Illa should be a savior for a while, thought Caramanos. How do we get beyond Dan Gilbert? Water. Someone to recognize that, that you know, there's gold in them dire hills. Right. And, you know, you keep hearing about Houston and Texas, and they have these boom and bust periods for the oil. We have the water. And if anybody had a brain in their head, that's where the future is. You've got, we've got a Democratic governor. In fact, we've got a Democrat office holders all across the spectrum. I think the, I think per, most dynamic person in government right now in Michigan is the, uh, is the uh, attorney general. She's far exceeded any of my expectations. This state has been so corrupt illegally. Engler and his cohorts put in place 
a Supreme Court with judges that he controlled and a court of appeals. And they ran this state like a little dictatorship. They even, with uh, uh, this last guy, tried to do that at MSU when they put Engler back in and then they put uh, uh, Judge Young in, 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 in place, sort of to fix that scandal because everything was fixed in Michigan. Right. That's why you don't see any priest prosecution, because they had one of their judges, you know, uh, align with the Catholic Church and kill all the all the uh, those the cases. Abuse of and priests. Engler and, and Young were going to kill all the cases uh, against uh, that doctor who, Larry who, who abused yeah, yeah who abused all the women. This 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 was is one of the most corrupt states that anyone can possibly imagine. And getting back to the attorney general, she's going after him. Right. She's going after him. The, the, I'm not against the Catholic Church. My my children, for Christ's sake, go to Catholic Church. <laughs> they go to Catholic school for me to say right. that. Right. Yeah, and I like Catholics. I mean, you know, my mom was a Catholic. My wife's a Catholic. But for you know, uh, <laughs> the Catholic Church is a political organization, and they tried to fix everything through Engler and their judges. And that's nonsense, and she's going after them, and I applaud her for that. Does any part of you miss going, being in elective politics? Are you ever tempted to try to get in there yourself again? Yeah, yeah, but I don't want to... Today, uh, yeah, if it was even 20 years ago when I, was, when I ran, it was less personal than it is today. Now, it, they literally, uh, what they want to do is try to personally destroy you. I'm not, I'm right. not interested with young children and being personally destroyed. That, I'm that, just not interested. That is, that is a problem. But if Gretchen Whitmer were to call you after hearing this and ask for how, what, some advice on how she could possibly fix Michigan, given that she's got a Republican legislature to contend with, what would you tell her? Well, I'd tell her the same thing. I tr- who uh, the the one who I did select when I ran for governor, I selected as my attorney general candidate. Uh, um, I'm getting old now. So, what was her name? I selected the attorney, uh, the Gen- former governor, um, Jennifer, Jennifer Grant. Granholm. I selected That's her. Right. She didn't listen to me. She was a she was a Duggan and, and McNamara protege. I would have told her to use the bully pulpit and get out there and start exposing what has gone on here because the Michigan legislature, and especially the Michigan Senate, has been, you know, an intractable, ridiculously bought-off organization. And look at the result. I mean, we have, we've taken Michigan, which was at one point the most progressive and, 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 and really a state that people could look at, into the backwoods of Mississippi, our school systems have fallen apart. Our roads are crumbling. Our water is polluted. Our schools are failing. Yeah, and and for what? What is? Oh, you tell me what those Republicans did. They've controlled our state essentially for the last thirty years. When the Jeffrey Figer biography or autobiography comes to be written, what would you like the subhead to say? What would you like, how would you define yourself and the meaning of your career in a few words? I haven't thought about that. On the whole, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. They were talking <laughs> about my tombstone. I haven't thought about not, the, not, sub, now, do you have the, goal? the substex of it. But uh, um, at some point, somebody will say uh, that he was a really kind of good lawyer because everybody thinks that um, somehow there, there's some trick into or, or what I do or there's some uh, there's something you know that they can't figure out why I'm successful and maybe it has to do with that I'm just kind of good at what I do with the exception of yourself who are the best lawyers you ever saw Jerry Smith the most power Jerry Spence had power, has power, but he's, he's still alive. He's 90, but he had a power that is, is I, I, I'm unable to, to, to put into words. You have to be in his presence. I've seen that power in other people. I've seen that power just standing there. I was behind in, in seventh grade, Martin Luther King. I've seen that power. I actually observed Elvis Presley in a car at a turnpike, a pay turnpike. I've seen sort of that aura. And I don't believe in any of that nonsense either. Um, 
but uh, he had a power, uh, and very, very few. I've never seen it again. Finally, do you, I know you live in the now, but do you have any goals, anything you want to accomplish yet that you haven't yet accomplished? Yeah, I would like to be president of the United States under the right circumstances. Other than that, I can't really say I've, I've done what I want to do, although I'm not going to rest my laurels on the law. I actually opened a hotel. I never thought I'd do that. I built and now I operate a hotel. That's it on the, on the island of Anguilla. That's right. I, I'm a father, which is probably my, my proudest accomplishment because they seem to be pretty good kids. Uh, although they're still young at 11, 15, and 17. Um, I, I, I wasn't successful in politics, and I usually don't let, uh, I, I, I never don't accomplish what I, what I set out to accomplish. So, But then again, I, I don't feel that old, other than my hip is bothering me a little with arthritis. So I think I'm kind of a young 68. How, in retrospect, how important were the Kevorkian cases in terms of the broader sweep of society? Oh, it's every person within earshot of your voice right now should understand that the way hospice operates today, which is if you need it, you get unlimited narcotics as much as you want, and you can end your life or your family can end your life simply by going into, quote unquote, hospice. That is all because of Jack Kevorkian, all. 100%. It didn't used to be like that. Now it is. And he is, that is uh, his legacy. And and his legacy, as I've always said, long after all the people who attacked him and criticized him and imprisoned him are dead, he'll be long remembered in far uh, more respect than those who persecuted him. Yeah, what was defending him like? Was that uh, you, I hard? Think... <laughs> defending him was hard because Jack was not the easiest client to deal with. Jack, I I was against the legislature, the police, the courts, the governor, and I could handle that. But Jack was very difficult too. He didn't like to be uh, controlled. The only way I could effectively represent him was to to stand in front of him and, and take control of the situation, and that was antithetical to Jack. And he would do everything he possibly could to undermine it. I think it was kind of a game for him. But it became exhausting after 10 years, almost 10 years that we were together, um, because he was hell-bent in some way, shape, or form, not only on undermining but failing. And I was never going to fail. So it was going to be him or me. And at some point, I had to step aside. I stepped aside when I ran for governor. And then I just, you know, at that point, he decided, he was going to take the ship down himself. Well, he, su- he succeeded at that. Finally, is there something you'd like people to know about Jeffrey Figer that they don't know? Um, well, my brother was the lead singer of the Knack. He sang My Sharona. And um, I like to uh, work out a lot, and I'm a very nice guy. And you like cats. How many cats do you have? I like current? cats. How many cats do I you have? five like? cats. Five cats. Do Five they, cats. They're getting old. Do they all have names? Of course they have names. We don't give them numbers. I think you should give your children numbers. They cause you less problem. Just tell them they were born to work for you. Uh, we have Kobe, and we have Haiku, and we have Orca, and we have uh, uh, a few others. Uh, uh, Moto and uh, one other one, Mika. We passed the test. You Two got girls, it. three boys. You got all your kids and all your cats' names correctly. Jeffrey Figer, thanks for making time for us today. It's always fascinating. Thank you. I hope it was interesting for you and your listeners. Always. We'll talk to you again soon. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Take care. The first time I ever met Jeffrey Figer was early in the Jack Kevorkian saga when I went to his office to cover one of the more routine assisted suicides for the New York Times. During the press conference, it dawned on me that while suffering people's desire to end their own lives was an important national issue, this lawyer and the relationship he had with his client was itself a fascinating story, as were both Figer and Kevorkian as human beings. I went on to write about it and them for the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Esquire, and 
various other publications. That's the kind of work I've always done as a journalist, telling you not just the story and the deeper meaning of the story, but about the people behind the story. Those three things are the essence of what I do. I've been doing journalism long enough that I've reported from countries that no longer exist, such as East Germany and the Soviet Union. I once got a personal letter from Richard Nixon and went to California to interview former President Gerald Ford about Watergate. I met eight governors of Michigan and remember when all TV was black and white and Paul McCartney was in a rather well-known band before Wings. But these days, I'm most concerned with Michigan, a state that has enough people, 10 million, to be a small country in itself, and not only incredible ethnic but geographic diversities. Not only are we the state to put the world on wheels, but we've got two peninsulas, the Sleeping Bear Dunes, the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, and the beautiful shorelines of four of the biggest lakes in the world. Yet, this is not the Michigan I grew up in. That Michigan had incomes well above the national average, good roads, and fine universities that sons and daughters of factory workers could afford to attend. It's not the case anymore. I'm not one of those old guys who thinks the world was better in 1975, though sometimes I think I'd like a combination of 1985 and Google. But I think it's incredibly important that we once again make this a state with an economy that's competitive and can be made to work for all citizens. We don't have that anymore, and we need to get it back. I intend to talk with people who are trying to get us there. We seem to be in a new ideological age these days, and so let me tell you that I'm fanatically devoted to the ideology of common sense. If raising taxes enough to fix the roads costs drivers less than the cost of car repairs because of bad roads, I'm there. I'm also naturally biased towards politicians who think our kids' ability to have a future should come first. But this won't just be a podcast about politics. I'm interested in books and art and music and, most of all, people. There are a lot of fascinating people and stories in Michigan, people you don't know about, and a lot of things you don't know about, the people you do. So come and listen. My goal is for you to listen every day and say, did you to your friends? As in, did you hear Jack Lessonberry's podcast today? He told me something I never knew before. So please join me. Think of this as something like the best of NPR with just as much depth and a little more irreverent fun. I can't say I'll leave the light on for you, but I can tell you that Siri, Alexa, Facebook, the iPod app, and whatever other social media you prefer will be standing by. This is your cheerful old curmudgeon, Jack Lessonberry. I'll see you again soon.